Hello Bio 2, this is Mr. B, and we're going to finish up birds today. And so, we ended our last video talking about the excretion of birds, how it is very similar to reptiles, kind of giving us more evidence that reptiles and birds are very closely related. So today we're going to continue on with their essential body functions, and again, kind of have some more references to reptiles again today, and similarities and differences. But we're going to start today with response, and this is going to be a big thing in birds, because birds have very well developed sense organs so they have a very well developed response system and these are adaptations that enable them to coordinate the move to coordinate the movements required for flight so this is really important and remember flight is just really a difficult process it requires a lot of different moving parts and in order for birds to carry it out they need to have a very well developed response system to kind of enable the flight to occur and so when we look at their brain, their brain is kind of again directly involved with their ability to fly and with those two, our biggest section there, the cerebrum, is really going to be focused on coordinating movements that are necessary for flight and then kind of one interesting thing we'll kind of get to in a second is if you look up here at the olfactory bulb up here at the top, that is an extremely tiny portion of the brain right here and if we're going to get to here in a second uh, that if you remember olfaction means the sense of smell and so since birds have a very small olfactory bulb in their brain, that means that their ability to smell is not going to be very good. So we're going to get to that in a second, but just by looking at the brain and remembering what the word olfactory bulb means, that's responsible for olfaction, the sense of smell, then you can tell that a bird does not have a very good sense of smell. But we'll get to that in a second. So for our first thing, so we're going to look at birds' brains and then quickly interpret and respond to different signals. And so again, that's going to be necessary for flight because again, when you're flying around, there's going to be a lot of different things coming your way. So you're going to need have to be able to respond appropriately and in a quick manner. And so the cerebrum, which remember is that very large portion, it uh, controls the behavior and it is very large. So behavior in birds is really uh, there's a lot of interesting behaviors in terms of like mating, taking care of their young, migration, interacting with the environment, a lot of different things that birds do. So the a portion of their brain that controls all those behaviors needs to be large. And then our cerebellum coordinates the movement of wings and legs. So that's another extremely important part. And it's much larger in birds than it is in reptiles. So reptiles don't have to worry about flight. So their cerebellum is going to be smaller, so it's bigger in birds. And then our medulla oblongata is going to coordinate our basic body processes, which is just what it has been doing kind of throughout so far. And so to kind of hit on now the bird senses, so birds have very well developed eyes, which allow them to see color very well. So you think our birds of prey, like our hawks and our eagles, they swoop down and they can pick up small animals either out of the water or out of fields. And so they have to have a very good, a uh, very good eyesight in order to do that and then most species of birds can actually hear quite well so they have very good sense of sight and very good ability to hear however taste and smell which remember we said the olfactory bulb are not very well developed in most birds so they can't really so they have two very enhanced senses in terms of sight and hearing however they cannot taste or smell very well at all and so for movement again this is obviously flight is going to be a big thing in birds so some birds however such as ostriches and penguins cannot fly so there are birds that actually have kind of evolved not to fly over time and then most birds however do fly and then their skeletal and muscular systems of flying birds exhibit adaptations that enable flight and actually a lot of the flightless birds still have some of these adaptations it's just theirs have been modified slightly but the ability to fly in birds came first and then some kind of went off and kind of evolved the ability not to fly so here is our basic skeletal system of the birds again each one of these is going to be play a role in <clears throat> in their ability to flight and we'll get to those in a second so in flying birds they have many large bones and they're fused together which makes their skeleton very rigid so not a lot of flexibility in the bird skeleton and so these <clears throat> bones, since they are so rigid, they form a frame that anchors the muscles that are used for flight. So the muscles for flight are very important in birds, and so they have a very strong anchor in their skeletal system that allows them to fly. And so then bones are also strengthened by what are called struts. So if we look at our picture here, these struts are the little lines going across the middle. So it's basically support beams basically going across the bones of birds. 
and they need those support beams because there's air spaces inside the bones that make them very lightweight. So air spaces inside the bones are very important because if you have big, thick, heavy bones, flight is going to be even more difficult than what it was before. So having the air spaces makes your bones lightweight and again gives you the ability to fly. And another adaptation for flight is that birds have very large chest muscles that power the upward and downward wing strokes that are necessary for flight. So that's again another important adaptation there, having very large chest muscles. And then they also have muscles that attach to a keel. So this is a really important structure that's found only inside of birds. It's what is called a keel, and it runs down the front of their enlarged breastbone or their sternum. So that's <clears throat> again, enlarged breastbone called the keel, found only in birds, that helps them with the ability to fly. And so for a reproduction in birds, so that's again going off flight, so both male and female reproductive tracts open into a cloaca, so that's been kind of the theme across the amphibians, reptiles, and now birds. And then mating birds will just press their cloacas together to transfer sperm from a male to a female. And there's also some males will have a penis that will transfer the sperm as well to the female. So pretty basic reproduction there. And then another important thing about birds is they lay amniotic eggs. So the same type of egg that is laid by the reptile. So that's an important, another important thing that shows us that they are related. And remember the eggs have a hard outer shell. And then most birds will incubate their eggs until the eggs hatch. And when we say incubation, that's they sit on the eggs keeping the eggs warm and then therefore they will hatch until they hatch and so when a chick is ready to hatch it makes a hole in the shell with a small tooth on its bill so there's a little uh, little structure on the end of the baby birds bill that helps them break through the shell and once the bird has hatched it rests for a while and lets its feathers dry and then all birds will start flying kind of at different times there and so to end Today we're going to kind of talk about our groups of birds and how the birds relate to nature. So, so far every group we've kind of been able to break down all the living groups, but in birds there are nearly 30 different orders that are alive today, so we don't really have enough time to get into each one. However, our largest order is called passerines, or perching birds, so they're birds that literally just like to perch on top of things. And so our other group birds, they have a variety of things, we have different types of pelicans, parrots, birds of prey, that's like our hawks and our eagles, cavity nesting birds, so birds that like to make their nests in like little holes, herons, which are giant water birds, and ostriches, which kind of fall into the flightless bird category. So there's a ton of different groups of birds, a lot of variety in this group. That's probably the most important thing to know. And then for our ecology, they interact with humans and our ecosystems in many ways. First one being that hummingbirds can pollinate flowers. The fruiting birds will disperse their seeds and their dropping, so they'll eat the seeds, they'll fly for a while, they'll let out the dropping, and then the seed can grow in a completely different area that could be 10 miles away, could be 100 miles away, depending on where it comes out. And then insect-eating birds can obviously catch insects, which will then control the populations, keep the mosquito populations down, things like that. So for our last thing, kind of another interesting thing about birds is that many birds will migrate long distances, usually seasonally, so our big duck hunters obviously know this. And then some species, they will use the stars and other celestial bodies as guides, so it's just things in the sky. They can actually look up and use those as markers to tell where they're going, because again, they migrate thousands and thousands of miles seasonally. And so how do they not get lost? Well, they actually have been shown to use different stars and other things up in the sky as their guide and others can actually use landmarks so they can go off landmarks in order to tell where they're going and they can use cues from Earth's magnetic field so another kind of interesting thing to help them with their ability to migrate so that's it for our birds let me know if you have any questions